There is only one thing on this earth more powerful than evil, and that's us. Hi, I'm Nicholas Brendan, and you're listening to the Buffy Back Issue Ben. Welcome to the Buffy Back Issue Ben, the show where we go through all the Buffy and Angel comics that are canon chronologically. I'm Zach. And I'm Emily. And this week we're back over with Angel. Yes, with an arc titled Family Reunion. Can you guess what happens? He meets his estranged father again for the first time in 200 years, ever since he killed him. Yes, that's exactly what happened. So, I thought so. killed means estranged in your book? I'm estranged from my father. Oh my gosh, you're not at all. We saw him yesterday, where he bought us pizza. Ooh, pizza. It was really good. Yeah. Thanks. Man knows me, there's a pitcher of beer waiting. But this time, for those who don't remember where we left off, Willow was at Angel's doorstep. Dun, dun, dun. Well, actually, it was Faith's doorstep. Actually, Previously I guess, owned by Giles. I guess, yeah, Angel's a bit of a freeloader. Entirely. He's entirely mooching off Faith for all of this. And this arc, as done through the majority of the season, is written by Christos Gage with art by Rebecca Isaacs and still continues to be probably the better half of season nine. I don't know what I'm saying probably. I like this stuff better. Yeah, it looks, it's, it's great. I'm going to raise someone else up by tearing someone else down. Whereas I will just elevate and say, this story is nice. I, I like it. It's not even what I meant to do, but when I said it out loud, it sounded much worse than I meant it to. And <laughs> well, I'm just going to own it. We all know what you meant. I like this stuff, so I generally don't want to be negative towards it. No, no. This stuff That's why we do this show. I'm not here to be like, I hate everything. <laughs> no, that's your other podcast. You know what I like about this show? That you don't hate everything on it? That I'm less of a character on this one. Yes. Like, the other one is like... Do you mean the grumpy old man character? Yeah, like, the elevated, like, curmudgeon, where this one, I'm just like, I really like Buffy and Angel. (laughs) And you know what? That one, not a character. (laughs) I know. That one's more real life. (laughs) Well, I've seen the curmudgeon once or twice. Look, him is not a good episode. Go Fish is not a good episode. Get it done. Just listening to bad episodes now. Are you just trying to be a curmudgeon on this show now? And the worst thing you come up with is, there were some episodes that weren't that great. I didn't like that Harmony Reality show thing. Out of the 12 show seasons that we had, you were like, meh, these five episodes, know, this not real... my favorite. Either way, this is the less extreme version of me, I guess. Yes. Not be playing up like, Mah! Not that I play things up for the other show, it's all real. Right. If you listen to both shows... I mean, it is all real. It's just exaggerated yeah. me. Why am I explaining this? I don't know. But you are the only person that I've ever met who monologues in real life. Yeah. And that's a real thing. I got things to say. Dear listener, you don't understand the monologues that happen. They're mostly about Buffy and Angel. <laughs> Most of the time they are. Sometimes the X-Men. I don't know. Sometimes you tell me about Captain America's history. Mm. Mm. But... Angel opens the door, and who should he see but Willow, who's holding the broken scythe that was destroyed when magic left the world. Okay, you actually said something really funny about this earlier, and I just noticed it. You were noting how many times Angel says people's names, and that's all he says. Like, just an exclamation. And literally, that's how this book opens with Angel going, Willow! And I never noticed how much of an angel trait that is until you were like, I hate that that's such an angel thing, but it is. It 100% is. Like, half of his dialogue is just yelling someone's name. And it's so funny because I didn't really notice it. And it's really been continuous in both shows, in the old IDW comics, and continuing now. Angel just likes to yell people's names. Oh no, I can hear it in his voice. Like, it's very much angel. It's just, I never noticed that that was one of his little tropes until now. Whenever you enter a room, Emily! It would be so much funnier if I did. Just start yelling out everyone's names that are in the room. Whenever customers come into the store, I'll just start yelling their names. But sometimes when people sometimes call them... Sometimes you're not great at remembering names. That's fair. Back but to family reunion. <laughs> Willow comes in, she's like, Andrew said he wanted to talk. So I guess Angel's been in contact with Andrew. What weird phone calls those must be. But fascinating. Maybe they're emails. I like to think of them as like AOL chats. So much better. Imagine them on AIM together. I think AIM was dead at this point. Also, I don't think Angel could use a computer. Fine, they're Skype chatting. I don't think Angel could figure out Skype. Why? He's an old man. You figured out Skype? Kind of. We literally practiced this last night. To be fair, we had to practice Skype. 
I had to figure out, it's a thing. I had to figure out to record to do a project that will probably end up on the show or it will just never happen. True. Bringing a thing back. But Willow's like, I heard you needed my help, and instead of calling, I thought I would just harass you in person. And who should appear but Giles' aunts? Sophie and Lavinia. With just the kindest greeting for Willow, and they call her Sunflower as well. I like how one of them is like, are there any doors in this house you haven't slammed? Like, does he slam doors, or does he break them? Both. I think more the breaking one. Probably. Willow gets right up in Angel's face. She's like, yeah, I know you're trying to bring Giles back. You're selfish, and it's going to blow up in your face. But you know how there's no magic? Well, I'm going to bring that back, which is far less crazy than your plan. And Angel's like, what? How do you know about my plan? You have an awkward nipple ring that I'm aware of. Everyone's aware of your weird nipple ring. But we find out the real reason that Willow's there. It's not just because she wants to... Help bring Giles back, which she has no faith in. Right. But instead, she really needs Angel's help to get to Connor? Because Connor's part of her grand plan. Yeah, Connor. Your favorite character. At one point, they call him a hipster in here. I appreciated that. It's probably because of his, like, seven-foot-long scarf. Oh, sorry. Who wanted a seven-foot-long scarf? Was it you? Yes, it was. I'm a tall person. I need a slightly longer scarf. You're like, oh, that five-foot-long scarf? Not long enough. Give me seven feet. It's five feet long. It is my height. Oh, boy. That's so short on me. It is a scarf that is as tall as I am. But Willow's reasoning basically is she's like, I need to get through some dimensions that still have magic. And since all the mystical barriers have been closed off, I need to get to a dimension that we can just tear a hole in reality towards. And Connor is my key to doing that. Because, you know, Kortoth was a super fun place. Right. Quick update. If you haven't seen the show, probably have. We say this a lot, like every episode. Kortoth is a dimension where Connor was raised so we could up him from a baby to an adult really fast so he could interact with everyone else. I mean, it wasn't plot convenient or anything. Right. Kortoth is not a fun place. It is the The helliest of hell dimensions. Yeah, it's the epitome of everything bad. But Connor managed to survive there for 17 years. Where he was referred to as the Destroyer. Evidently. Good nickname. Do you like that one? I mean, it was real ominous when they were like, the Destroyer is coming, and then it was just this kid. Yes. And he came through, he's like, hi, Dad. Let's remember that. Right. Literally his first line on the show. Hi, Dad. We'll come back to that in a moment. Look, I don't like that bit later on. I know. You've told me. And Angel's like, look, you're not involving Connor. Connor's better off without us. Connor's doing fine. I have somebody watching him. He's fine. He has a girlfriend. He's fine. I'm not talking to him. And Angel's like, how dare you try and involve Connor in this? I thought you were better than this, Willow. And she just slaps him across the face. She's like, says the most real thing about this book, which also lets me really know that the writer knows Angel very well. She's basically like, look, how dare you blame me for anything? It's because of you and trying to do your over-the-top, grandiose things for redemption that we're all in this terrible situation and everything is your fault and you do this over and over and over again, and you're doing it again with Giles, and it's gonna blow up in your face because that's what it always does, you idiot. What does Angel say right after this? Willow. That's it. <laughs> We're just gonna say your name, because that's what I do. But it's hey, true. Angel ruins everything. It, but it's really true. Nothing Willow said was wrong. That's what he does. He does a big thing to try and make up for a lot of other things, and it blows up in his face. Yeah, every single time. Moth to the flame is an idiot. But Angel agrees that well, if they give Connor the chance to make that decision himself, he will take Willow to Connor with the provision that Willow helps Angel with his project after. Yeah, Willow's like, hey, I have a piece of Giles' soul in this scythe. Convenient how we all have pieces of it because Giles was holding this when he died. And if you help me, I'll put something in your nipple. Not the words that she uses. Should have funnier that way i'm glad that she didn't and they leave from england to go back to america but not before leaving their home in the care of sophie and lavinia who immediately leave their post because morrissey is playing in prague that sounds fun i like prague sounds like a good time better than going from england to la to rip open a hell dimension right i do like that angel has upgraded from his trench coat situation usually a blanket over his head yeah to this time a hoodie and a baseball cap but his hoodie is emblazoned with the union jack 
and it is fantastic. You know what? He's upgraded from basic black. He has. I like it. Except, as we all know, baseball hats do not really cover all of your face, so... Are you just saying this because of the sunburn you got yesterday at the beach with your baseball hat? No, you can also see it on Angel's face. Look. I know. I wish we had done a little bit more with the shading because he just seems to be out in direct sunlight, so I feel like he should be on fire. Well, they're still in the building right now. Anyway. Uh, Are you not getting that vibe? I get the vibe that they're in the building. Yeah. And the building being the airport, so I guess he survived this whole flight. But after the flight from England to LAX, who should be greeting them? But Gun! Nanners. Nanners. I don't know why you called him Gun. His name is Nanners and you know it. Because what does Angel say? Nanners. Nope, Angel says Gun! And enjoy this brief cameo from Gun, because he's going away real quick and we'll never see him again. At least I think so it's far. because he's not Nanners. Nanners has some interesting plot points. Gun is boring and drinks coffee. Literally the one thing he does in this. No, he gets nothing to do. Hey, Dark Horse, are you listening? You know what makes Angel interesting? I don't think they're listening. There's a chance. There is, yeah. I don't know, we get some decent listenership. And by this point, we should be really up there. Wow. Weird. Angel is not the most interesting thing in Angel. Angel is made interesting by an ensemble around him. And you know what's an interesting ensemble? I don't know, pre-established characters that have been around since 99 or later? Like Nanners? Bring back Angel's cast. And the fish. They can't bring back Beta George. Why? IDW owns it. Don't care. We could still get Gun, Gru, Connor. Make some deals. Get Gwen, the fish. Nina. If you, apparently someone wants the fish. So do I, really. Everybody wants Beta George. It turns out that Angel has had Gun watching Connor all along and giving him monthly reports. Where is Angel getting the money to pay Gun? Because the term the hired situation. is used very specifically. And Gun drives everyone over to Connor's school. He has tinted windows, so Angel won't burst into flame, except that there had to be a special kind of glass that Wolfman Hart made for that not to happen. Well, whatever. I mean, he's smoking, but I don't think tinted windows work in that regard. No. And this is the panel that makes everything that we cut out work for me. Except for one line, but whatever. Angel asks how everyone is. Gunn says that he can't track down Illyria. Kate's good. Back with the LAPD, heading up their supernatural crimes unit. Look, I still can't work around the Kate thing. I just don't like her being a part of things. Yeah. I know she popped up a couple of times in our world. Let's just say that we didn't see those adventures. Don't have to tell Angel about Lauren. What with the whole being in the center of the world. Singing a continuous note to hold it all together. Yeah. Nina got married to Jason Biggs. Probably not in this reality. No, probably not. But that's what the actress did. Oh, wow. Fun fact. And the fact that we don't mention any of the other weird, awkward IDW adventures means that I cut them all out of continuity. When I read this page, I was like, oh, thank God we could cut all that crap out. Mm -hmm. All the stuff we didn't cover on this show. And as Gunn pulls up, knowing that Connor's sight class has gotten out one minute ago, and Connor's already outside with his girlfriend. Her name is Natalie. And Connor is working on being a social worker. It's very cute. And Angel immediately has second thoughts, starting off with Willow. Just has to say someone's name. By itself. And he starts to try to back out of it. Willow's like, no, we flew across the ocean for this. We're going to at least talk to him. This is one of my favorite pages from this whole arc. Connor looks into the distance, sees Angel in a car, and then the next panel, there's just nothing there. And Faith's like, hey, where the hell did he? And then Connor just lands on the roof of the car, looks, and is like, are you wearing a hoodie? And yes, he is wearing a hoodie. I just love it. I love that Connor sees it from afar. He just has this little smile. He's like, ooh, like leaps 20 feet in the air. Super non-conspicuous. And immediately, where do they go? But to a bakery where Angel gets like 17 muffins. Why does he have so many muffins? I don't know. I mean, that's how he tried to make up with Cordelia. It was like by buying her muffins? assorted sandwiches and goods to go in LA. Sandwiches. So he just buys Connor a bunch of muffins. He's like, super proud of you, kid. And the two of them hug it out. And they haven't hugged it out since Connor came back from the dead. And then they do the only rational thing and go to a pub to have a beer. And you know what, Connor? Not a terrible taste in beer. Smithwick's? Yeah, not bad beer. Oh, well, there you go. And Connor's like, when you were busy buying muffins, Willow told me all about Kortoth. Let's do that thing. Faith is also along with them on this. We haven't really mentioned her that much. 
But Faith pops up at this moment and she's like, um, Angel? Stop being a crap daddy, crap dad. Yeah, do you realize what you're doing? We flew across the ocean so that you could talk to your son, whose calls you've been ignoring, just so that you could kind of offer him up as a sacrifice to... Go to hell? Yeah, to maybe get some pieces of Giles' soul back. Like, maybe that's not the best parenting moment. Maybe let the guy who's dead be dead and focus on your kid. And Angel's like, shut up, you have a terrible dad and don't tell me how to dad. Yeah, it's not their best moment. Before Angel can even say anything, Connor's like, I'm doing it. Angel's like, what? You can't do that. I won't let you. Connor's like, look, everybody's falling apart. Without the magic in the world, suicide rates are spiking and people are just becoming more and more depressed. And you can see it in the psych wards and the world is falling apart. He's like, I gotta do something. And we fought so many times, you clearly can't kill me or stop me. Yeah. Also vice versa. And Angel's like, but to Kortoth? Like, do you have to go to Kortoth? And he's like, I was there as a little kid, and I survived. It was fine. And they go to the only place they can go, the Hyperion. Yes. We're back at the hotel. And again, like so many things, this is the last time, at least so far, we see the hotel. And I love it. We see this first, like, establishing shot of the hotel, which is, like, the exact same shot we would see at the show of, like, all these cars passing by right in front of it. And then we go inside, and everything's the same, including their weird round couch. I was in a hotel the other day, and they had a weird round couch in the middle of the reception. At this point, it's been long enough. They need a new weird round couch in that hotel. It's just been sitting there for years. Yeah, it really has. And Willow has Connor surrounded by a bunch of candles and some crap drawn on the floor last time i think it was a pentagram it's not this time there must be so much wax on that carpet in that lobby and angel being angel just has to yell a name connor he's being held back by faith and gun as willow cuts into a very in shape connor lots of abs yeah she's using the scythe to cut some weird shape into his chest so that they can rip open the world into Kortoth. look if you want to see this page it's hanging in my store. Yeah, where might the original live? My store. It's up on the wall. If you see a page of a shirtless man being cut on, that's the one. There it is. And Willow successfully rips open the portal to Kortoth, and they gear up to go in to leave Gun behind as backup just in case. Kortoth's bad enough that a regular human probably shouldn't be mixing it up in there. And Angel, Willow, Connor, and Faith walk through this tear in reality. And it looks like crap. Yeah, Kortoth is not great. Lots of dead things. Real overcast. And they're only there for about three seconds before these flying things come at them. And they just say food. Thank God they speak English. They're like big demonic bats, but with 18 rows of teeth and six eyes. Yeah, they're gross. They're also hairless. And they're about to eat everyone until they see Connor. They're like, oh my God, it's the devil. And they run away or fly away. Yes. If you don't remember, time passes differently in other dimensions. It almost always goes faster. We never once went into a dimension where time moves slower. Yeah. Because, you know, it helps to... Move the plot along if it's faster. Yeah. That's how you get from a baby to a teenager in, like, three weeks. True. And Connor's confused. He's like, they know who I am? Like, I haven't been here in what must be centuries. Yeah. Interestingly enough... Willow's plan does work. She gets her magic back the second that she's back in Kortoth. The only problem is that magic works a little differently in this dimension. She's got to kind of figure out step by step how to recalibrate herself. Yeah. So her first spell, she means to defend them from the flying bat things. But instead she gets a bouquet of flowers in her hands. But her next spell works because she kind of figures it out. And so their next spell is to put a protective barrier over the rip that they made in reality so that nothing can escape and go kill gun so that only humans can go through anything from Kortoth is stuck yeah and while willow is figuring out her magic so she can move on to another dimension to try and restore everything they find shelter and have to murder a bunch of things yes and in the shelter there's a weird painted picture of connor relatively accurate to how he looks yeah, I don't know how they knew what his hair was going to be like. Because it was super short when he was in Kortoth. Yeah, and now it's the same length as Willow's. Well, Willow has that asymmetrical haircut. Yeah. Connor's is real even. Connor's is longer. You had a real thing about Connor's hair. Well, most of the time it's like greasy and gross. <laughs> but if you look at photos of him in between seasons of Mad Men, it's hilarious. 
Didn't they make him balding when he was not balding? Yeah, his character is supposed to have a receding hairline, so they just kept on shaving his head further back. And then when he was in between seasons, like he would have like his regular hair, but then there's like this weird shadow of stubble where it was growing back from where they shaved it. It looks funny. I bet. Whatever, he made a ton of money on that show, so he's fine. Yeah. And they're attacked by a bunch of demons, and Connor gets real aggressive real fast. He's like, hold it up, you just gotta punch its heart out of its stomach. And everyone looks at him really funny, he's like, that was strangely aggressive. And you he's just... like, whatever, we had to figure it out. And Angel figures out real quick that Kortoff increases everyone's aggression and might return Connor to the relatively unpleasant individual he started the show as. He was the worst. The other important thing that we learn in this conversation is that Angel, if we all remember, he put a bunch of happy memories in Connor's head. and he After cutting his throat. Yep. And he put Connor with a family and gave him all fake memories. And then Connor regained his old memories, but still had the new happy memories, and they kind of mashed together. Yeah, so he was like kind of living life like this. But we find out that when the seed left the world... That all of Connor's magic happy memories also left the world. And Angel gets kind of concerned because the last time Connor only had one set of memories, he became kind of a suicide bomber. Right. In a sporting goods store. And Connor's like, don't worry, there are no sporting goods stores around here, so we're fine. Also, I have a bunch of new happy memories thanks to you. That's very sweet. You didn't say that sporting goods bit. I embellished. You did embellish, yeah. They didn't really mention that. But they're trying to get Willow to make a new portal for her so that she can pop over to a different dimension and continue on her magical journey while leaving the humans to go back through their portal. But as Willow is preparing this, a bunch of Connor's followers appear out of nowhere because Connor has a bunch of followers. They look kind of like red dogs. That stand on their hind legs. They're very cute. It's like, we have followed the path of the Destroyer because he and his father, Holtz, the guy who stole Connor as a baby, shared love together, and love is forbidden in Kortoth, and now we're all about that. They're a bunch of hippies. And they've been... A bunch of demon hippies. Martyrs for centuries. This is my favorite Faith line in the whole thing, where she goes, look at you, hipster Jesus. I enjoyed that bit. You enjoyed the remark that was disparaging towards Connor? The part where it called him a hipster? Yeah. Yeah. And so we find out from these little red dog dudes that there's, like, a couple dozen of them who are free right now, who are following Connor, but a bunch of their number have recently been taken captive. Two score. Yes, and they will very quickly be eaten. So By Kortoff. He's like, our prayers have been answered. We find out that their compatriots are in prison, and the leader of the Red Dogs, he's like, so you're going to go save all of my people, right? And Connor's like, look, that was really not the plan, like... We're very close to accomplishing everything we need to do here, so no. And then Willow we'll opens up a no. portal. And she's like, we can get out of here. And Angel's like, ah, oh, thank God. Let's get away from all this weirdness. And Connor basically is like, yeah. Just kidding. I have to go save the dogs. If anyone's going to be the one who let the dogs out, it's going to be me. That was the worst. That was literally the worst. And Angel's like, you know what? I'd do anything for you except call you, so I'm going to stay too. And it turns out that everybody's going to stay because when one of the gang stays, they all stay to help free the Red Dogs. Back in England, Whistler, Pearl, and Nash have broken into Angel and Faith's home and stolen all their magical doohickeys because they're gathering that stuff up and it's definitely not nefarious. And Sophie and Lavinia are like, oh darn, oh well. Oh bother. They're not Winnie the Pooh. In my world, they are. Also sad that I know that's your Winnie the Pooh impression. And Whistler's like, hey, I'm going to take your stuff. Tell Angel to meet me on our anniversary at this diner. Whistler, out! Doesn't say it quite like that. Maybe Angel will walk in and go, Whistler. He should. And back in the lovely dimension of Kortoth, the whole gang is approaching all of the prisoners, and Faith is super pissed. She's like, I just should kill Angel and get the hell out of here. No, that's just the dimension talking. I I can't do that. And Connor's being sad because he's God here. Right, because he's like, how many of these red dogs have died for me? And for what? I didn't even know that they were here. I didn't even know anything. I want a red hot dog. Seriously? I guess. I'm just thinking about red that. dogs. Yeah. I'm thinking about Clifford. He'd be delicious. Ew. 
But Angel and Connor are fighting back to back, as they've done from time to time. Getting their way to the prisoners. Fighting all these demons. And of course, they free the demons who are like, Kortoth is coming to kill us. And like, what an interesting metaphor you have. And they just go, it's a metaphor. And then all of a sudden, a giant brain with teeth and body okay. appears. So imagine an elephant. Now make that elephant really long. Have you thought about this? No. I'm just... Okay. You're just describing as you go. Yeah. So we have a long elephant. Now I need you to take all of the flesh off of its back so its spine and like the back of its ribs are exposed. Now take that scalp and ears. Rip all that off so it's an exposed brain. Take the lower jaw, remove that, and then in the upper jaw, make it have pointy, jagged teeth, and it's just vomiting black bile. It also doesn't have a trunk, just so we're clear. I guess that's gone too. Yeah, all the skin is gone from its face. So yes, that's not a terrible description. Thanks for that trunk one. I was really missing an element there. Yeah, you really were. I was waiting for you to get there and you just kept ignoring it. Yeah. I don't know, maybe the elephant one falls apart. It's like a rhinoceros. <laughs> But take away the horn. Okay, again. No, I'm not doing it again. Um, Look, a big husky African leathery thing, but with an exposed brain and no lower jaw. Yeah. So everybody's very upset about this. Just as a side note, Faith and Angel have been having a heart to heart in the middle of this because everybody loves having heart to hearts in the middle of hell dimensions, trying to fight off a bunch of demons. And they've started to make up some of their, not really differences, but their general irritation and lack of patience with each other. It's very sweet. She's like, I'm sorry that I think you have stupid plans. He's like... He's like, I do have stupid plans. I'm sorry that I dragged you into my stupid plans. Kortoth, which is apparently a demon, along with a dimension, vomits up gross energy and shoots at everyone, and Willow creates a barrier to save everyone. And Angel's like, get us out of here, make a portal. And she's like, I'm busy. I'm doing a thing. You are standing there. And in the middle of this is the line that bothered you the most. Yeah, so as all of this is going on, Angel, unable to use full sentences, just goes, Connor. Okay, you can't judge people for not using full sentences. Yeah, I like to pick and choose my words. Yeah, I know. Okay, continue. Mostly I like to remove them from random parts of sentences. Yes, that's also very true. And Connor just goes, I love you, Dad. And Angel looks and was like, did you just call me? Yeah, you know what? He called you Dad. He's called you Dad many a time. At that point, they're interrupted by Kortoth itself, just so we're clear. Shooting things. But he should really be focusing on the other half of that sentence. I don't think Connor's ever said, I love you. Ever? I don't know. But he's called... No, he hasn't. But he's referred to Angel as Dad many a times. He's also referred to Angel as Angel many a time. He's certainly called Angel Dad more than I've called my own father Dad. That's true. I call him old man. That's true. That's weird. Yeah, I don't like it. Did you just call me that thing you've called me a lot of times? I mean, I don't know why you just didn't say my name and stop. That's what I do. Connor! Willow! Faith! Kortoff, I like you the least. Red dog? Gun? Gun, can you hear me? Gun cannot hear you. Gun is outside the portal. And then Connor starts, he's like, Father, can you hear me? How do you know that song? Do you know it from the Barbra Streisand Millennium album? It was a reference in Simpsons did. It was from Yentl from Barbra Streisand. Nelson did it. Babs did it first. When, is it Papa? That's what he did. Yeah. Yeah. It's called Papa Can You Hear Me. Okay, yeah, I know it from it's the from Simpsons. It's from Yentl. Okay. But she also sang it during her Millennium concert. Right then. So Willow and Kortoth are having it out. He's blasted at her and then she gets her mojo together and blasts him right back. And life is great because we can finally fight him, except that he gains all of his strength back and he's like, death, death to you all. And Willow falls down on the ground and they're like, Willow? Is that Angel? Is that Angel's line? Did he just say a name? Willow turns to camera and, oh no. We've got a problem. Yeah, because Willow's going dark. She's getting all black and veiny in the face, pitch black eyes. She's about to turn evil because that's what she does. It's nice that she has this, like, two seconds of understanding before she goes evil. She's like, ah, I'm gonna do that thing again. This place makes you all mean. And Willow levitates into the sky and just blasts the hell out of Kortoth. And she's like, all right, evil now. 
also taking over this dimension. Because I can, bitches. Ha ha! So the nice part is that Evil Willow is more than a match for Kortoff. So she kills him. Yeah, conveniently, he's out of the picture. Yeah, so he's all done now. But Angel's like, Kay, Kay Willow, you're all done now. Like, and she does you can come whole... back now. And she's like, no, I won't. It's basically that scene out of Fellowship when Kate Blanchett's like, I'd be beautiful and terrible at the same time. Yes, it is, actually. Same crap. Like that. Except that Willow goes for it instead of turning it down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's like, place could use, you know, a new throw rug, a bit of subjugation, but after that... A new queen. Angel's like, F that, and leaps into the air to bite her. It is previously established in the lore, when a vampire bites you, you get this like sense of euphoria so you don't turn away. And Willow turns unevil because she's getting high off being bit by an angel. Like that show. Touched by an angel. Yes, I wish it were called Bit by an Angel now. <laughs> it would have been so much better. But the only problem here too is that because it's Kortoff, Angel's natural inclination is to be a vampire, so once he is a vampire, it's very hard for him to come out of it, a la Dark Willow. And he just whines at everyone. He's like, it's too late for me. You'll have to kill me. It's better off this way. Actually, he says, Faith, do it quick. So he's making Faith do it. Faith has really gotten the short stick in all of this. Like, she just kind of got dragged along to this dimension, and she's here now, and she's had to kill a bunch of terrible things, and... And she was dragged to Los Angeles. Yeah. Stay in London. Yeah, totally. And Willow stops him. She's like, you know what? Shut up, idiot. We're fine. Just turn back into a regular guy. He's and Angel like, just goes like, oh. Oh, no. Yeah, yes, I can. All right, problem solved. Sweet. Yeah. You're not evil. I'm not evil. Life is great. No one's dead but a bunch of dogs. Poor dogs. And Willow just says to Angel, she's like, I don't forgive you, but I can't hate you. Have some Giles in your nipple. Yeah. So she gives... I should be responsible for scripting. We're all glad that you're not. The dogs make it through to a safe dimension. Connor Yoda's then. He's like, the force will be with you. Always. Because he doesn't know what else to say. Yes. And Faith is very sweet. She's like, yeah, well, that's close enough to a religion. Like, I would consider it if I consider religions. And Willow says goodbye to everybody because she is about to go onward to a different dimension to a totally separate graphic novel to go find the magic in the world again and whoopsie daisy Kortoth's not dead and he is ready to kick some ass but luckily we're close enough to both portals that willow hops through hers and the other three hop through theirs and they make it back through just in time to escape everything so and they see gun who's like i just heated up my coffee why are you back so soon also i have a submachine gun it's weird seeing Gun with a gun. Yeah, and Gun's actually kind of funny. He's like, things either went right or horribly wrong. Kind of in between. They accomplished everything they meant to accomplish. They got some dogs freed. Life is good. And as they're getting patched up on the weird circular couch, Angel's like, yeah, I have to go back to London where I'm going to bring back Giles through my nipple. But I think I'll take a week so I can spend time with you, buddy. It's very sweet. And Faith's just like, what am I going to do? And Gun's like, I don't I don't know. Do you, do you want to hang out? I guess. They must. But Angel says something very ominous at the end. He's like, look, Faith, um, I'm not going to be your responsibility for much longer. Because Faith, all along here, everybody's been like, Faith, it's your job to stop Angel. Faith, it's your job to stop Angel. And she's like, why is any of this my job? And no, like, I'm all done with this. And they're all like, you're stronger than him and we're not, so your responsibility. And Angel's like, Faith, I'm not going to be your responsibility for much longer. It's almost over. Meaning he almost has Giles put back together. I almost have a full man inside my nipple. That's so weird. I didn't make it a nipple thing. I know, but you are bringing it up at every opportunity. Because it's hilarious. And even more ominously, the very last page of this is that we see... That the London Slayers, jumping all the way back to them with our friends Nadira and company, that they are kind of reeling from Drusilla's Reign of Terror. Reign of Terror, Rampage, whatever. And one of the girls has some information. She says, I saw Angel there. And Nadira's like, ah, Angel. Twilight. Right. 
And then she's like, but that's not all. Angel was fighting with somebody, and she was like, ah, fighting. I love to fight drunk. It's my and jam. Like, and they're like, no, he was fighting with Faith. And we just see Nadira's shocked face. End of arc. Dun, dun, dun. I love getting Gun and Connor back. I love the ensemble. This is the most I've ever liked Connor. Even more than like season five or after the fall. Yeah. It's still the most I've ever liked Connor. All right. That's fine. I've always liked Connor. No, you didn't. Yeah, I did. You didn't like him when he was annoying in the TV show? Yeah, I did. No one likes him when he's annoying like that. I think you had to be watching it live and like wanting that baby to come back. When you watched it, it was just like, all right, it's been two hours. He's back now, I guess. Yeah. When I was watching it, it was like months off. Like, no! Well, no, you Where's st- the baby? You would still tell me when the breaks were. We were watching it. You'd be like, and here was a three month break. Were you ready for the next episode? <laughs> Easy does it. It's legitimately what happened every single time. It's, I don't remember when they were. You remember exactly when they were. Or you'd watch it, you'd be like, that was a promo shot. That was a promo shot. I do remember the promos. Not all of them off the top of my head, but a number of them. Leave me alone. <laughs> Make it sound like watching TV with me is the worst thing ever. It's very informative. Okay. You're a very informative TV companion. But unfortunately, this is the last we see of Gunn and Connor, and I know that a lot of Angel's supporting cast is dead. Yeah. But let's bring back the ones we have. They're good yeah. characters. They're well-established characters. It's not like these aren't people that we have like a long-standing history with. Right. It would be pretty easy. I mean, and Buffy works off of an ensemble literally all the time. Why can't Angel work off of an ensemble that has almost as long of a history? Why can't Gunn and Connor be more Riley-esque, where they just kind of pop in and out, Even do that. their thing, leave? Like, it doesn't bother me that... And Gunn and Connor are way more interesting than Riley. Well, and it doesn't bother me that Gunn and Connor were only here for, like, half a second, because that's fine. They live in L.A. It's not unreasonable to expect them to not be in every single arc. It but... bothers me that Gunn wasn't in it at all. It was just like, hi, Gunn. Bye, Gunn. How was your coffee, Gunn? Didn't have time to drink it. So bad. Oh, poor gun. Like, at least Connor got an arc in here, but at this point, I mean, unless you count Spike, Gun is Angel's longest running ally who isn't dead. That's depressing. Doyle, Cordelia, Wesley. Mm. Gun has a history. And the last time we saw him, he was super interesting. Nanners. He was Nanners. Maybe you should go back to that. To being evil? Mm-hmm. I don't want him to be evil. I want him to be Nanners. That's all I want. And in our one shot to finish off the arc, we have a, the writing done by Christos Gage. This last one shot is split into two parts. The first one, is pencils are done by Lee Gabbett with inks by Derek Friedolf. Friedolf? Part two, pencils and inks are done by David Lapham. I hate pronouncing names. <laughs> and this one shot's called The Hero of His Own Story. And the first part is about Whistler. Angel goes to meet Whistler at the location that was left with Sophie and Lavinia, and Angel finds him at a diner. Yeah, it's it's a pizza place. And Angel's like, hey, how's it going, buddy? And Whistler's like, shut up, and snaps Angel's arm. Yeah, not the kindest way to say hi. So this arc is the first time we've ever seen that Whistler is actually a physical threat. He's only ever been a guy that talks at things. Yeah. This is literally the first time that Whistler has ever been any kind of a physical threat. Right. And we find out Surprise. that Angel knows that Whistler's working with Carla Nash. Well, Sophie and Lavinia probably would have mentioned that. What with the breaking and entering. Oh, that's probably true. And Whistler's like, hey, I'm just doing what I've always done. Like you a lot, buddy. But ever since I found you back in 96 eating rats in an alley, you were supposed to be my golden ticket. You were supposed to open up a whole new universe and save everything. And Angel's like, I was going to bring everyone over, but Buffy wasn't going to let me. And Whistler's like, shut up, idiot. You screwed it up. You birthed the whole universe. You destroyed all the magic. And now I have to fix your crap. And my whole thing is I'm just supposed to observe and help put you on your path, but not actually interact. You're making me get off my ass and I don't like it. Yeah. And the interesting part here is that Angel's like, look, you weren't really going to let us bring everybody over, were you? And Whistler doesn't really answer him. He's like, nah, a bunch of people were going to die. You could have brought the good ones. Yeah. He's like, you really could have minimized the damage, as it were. So Angel's feeling pretty solid about his choice at this point. Buffy was right. I never should have done that. 
year-long adventure that I did. So Whistler's like, fine, let me tell you a story. What? Is it? what? I don't know, I think it just reminds me of Tales of the TMNT. Oh. Let me tell you a story. Is that what happens at the beginning of every one? Every single one. Well, why don't you tell us a story? Whistler's parents got it on, and it turns out Whistler's parents were a pure-blooded demon and someone that was connected to the powers that be, and they... Procreated. Swapped bodily fluids and made a baby. But the problem is that nobody liked this. No one likes your half-breed baby. Yeah, so they killed the parents. Both the powers that be and the demons in general. So the demon probably went to the deeper well. Yeah, probably. And the power one, yeah, he's probably just dead. Um, But nobody really knew what to do with the baby because the powers that be were like, look, we can't just kill a baby. Like, it's not his fault for existing. So we're going to use him to our own ends, which somehow seems terrible as well. And as previously established, Whistler's whole gig is creating balance. Whether it's balance for good or evil, like the world has to have a system of checks and balances. Sometimes he's helping things out, sometimes he's burning things down. But he says he always chose for the greater good. And then he was going to help create this whole new reality, again by people getting it on. Yeah. And then Buffy destroyed the seed, and Whistler had a vision of the future. Boy, it's been a while since we had the power of sending visions. Right, but this is not a happy vision. Good old times. I don't know if any of the visions were happy, but this one's definitely not. It's a vision of the world dying, quite literally. Everybody is falling apart. There's no more hope or joy left in the world, and it's just dark, dismal, and dying. And I like how Whistler's like, you think you've seen hell dimensions. You haven't seen them. This is hell. And it's just like a guy wearing a hoodie. And another guy wearing a gas mask. Angel's been to hell a couple of times. Like that time that Buffy had to stab him when a Catholic was going to destroy the world. Oh, I remember that. Or that time that Los Angeles was sent to hell. Yeah, that Or that too. time that Angel went to Kortoth. When like was that? A few that? minutes ago. <laughs> or that time that Angel went to that holding dimension that Wolfram and Hart had Lindsay stored in. Yeah. Or that time that Angel went to Pylea. So Angel's been around. So many hell dimensions. So many. They never go to a happy dimension. That'd be so much funnier. They were like, on this happy dimension, where literally nothing bad happens. <laughs> Things are fine. I'd be like, I don't, I don't actually get it. I guess Buffy went to one of those ones. Yes. Then they brought her back. She was so mopey. Wouldn't you be? I guess. If I was in perfect paradise and then I was brought back and had to crawl out of my own grave, yeah, that'd be a bit of a bummer. So, Whistler's like, look, I'm going to give you another chance here to help me out because... Summer vacation, but amplified. I don't really want to work with Pearl and Nash. They're pretty terrible. So I'm giving you the option to join me again. Because I'm going to bring magic back to the world. I know you're all about that. You seem to want to help the witch. And Angel's like, that's different. And she put things in my nipple. What are you offering my nipple? So Angel says, fine, I will help you. But only because you're bad crazy and you need a bit of help in another direction and whistler is like you know what not what i meant i'm gonna punch you through the stomach yes it's very gross and then he's about to stake angel and he's like look i can't stake you i like you too much still but i'm happy to punch out your guts quite literally and then he leaves saying don't ever let me see you again and then just like ah my stomach i'm not sure if i actually use this for anything or not with my vampire anatomy and with that we go over to part two of the hero of his own story. And we start back in the Dust Bowl in Oklahoma in 1935. With a naked lady. Yeah, and she somehow managed to summon a demon. And the demon's like, look, there's one thing I have to do. I have to grant you a wish before I can go on my way. Whatever, whatever, whatever. What do you want? I guess I'll stop at the Dust Bowl. And she's like, put a baby in me. He's like, interesting choice. But sure, I'll stick around for a minute. Not what I was expecting. But yet he does it. And he puts... Twins. Yeah, a few babies in her. Yeah. So this woman is now pregnant with twins, or rather, she ends up having twins. Pearl and Nash. And we see the twins when they are probably 10-ish, 12, maybe. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Yeah, creepy blue eyes. And murdery. And elf-like ears. Why are they so elf-like? I don't know. To make them look like demons? I don't know. And we find out that this woman is absolutely insane. Yeah, she's real murdery. Yes. People come to their house, they're like... We have a warrant. Blam! Blasted through the guts. Yeah. So basically With she's Pearl like... Pearl and Nash's eye lasers. She's like, we're going to use you two to create a whole new generation of demons. You two will be the creators of the whole world. Cleanse the earth, my children! 
Yep. It's like, blam, blam, eye lasers. And they do that. They go about and have a bunch of children. Except then, all of a sudden, these people come and they kill all of Pearl and Nash's children, who are adults at this point. Yeah, rough times. Yeah. And they're like, babies, oh no. And then Angel shows up as Twilight. He's like, help me out here. I'm like, sure. Yeah. Exact dialogue, by the way. Because Pearl and Ash's mother has instilled upon them the need to control the magic that they find. And, I don't know, it's super weird. Rule the humans. Pretty much. Look, and then Buffy destroys the seed of their mom, who's like 80,000 years old, dies because, you know, no more magic to keep her together. Did you notice the birds here who were hooked up to IVs? That's gross. Didn't notice that. Yeah. It is super gross. So this woman is in a hospital bed and she has like traditional IVs in her, but she also has three chickens plucked, hanging upside down with tubes taped over their beaks feeding into her. Gross. And she's like, don't let me die painfully. So they have to commit some matricide, green laser blast their mum, And they're like, we're going to get that Twilight fella. Yeah. Because he's not very nice to us. So now they are motivated by salvation and revenge towards Angel. But that is family reunion. Nanners is back, baby. Say goodbye, because so far he hasn't come back. Nanners was back. And Connor. Bye, Connor. Bye. You seem sad about that. Yeah. Look, I said I liked him better this arc than I can say for the others. He was less annoying, made less weird choices about his hair. He was in hell before. That's not my fault. And he also was better about not feeding into Angel's ridiculousness. I like this one, and I, I'm a bit of a sucker for it just because it gets the cast back together. Do you like an ensemble piece? A little bit. But I liked it too. I liked seeing that that we could do things even though the magic is gone in the world. I liked that we were kind of back to how Angel felt in the TV show, like hopping over to other dimensions kind of thing. But it was just a return to form, and unfortunately one that we don't see again. But it was really good. I also liked that this was only a four issue arc. I feel like they could have stretched it to five, but it would have just been unnecessary. Yeah. So I like that they made that call. Good call, everybody. And Angel at Whistler probably had to need to have it out before we build the finale. Yeah, exactly. That'll do it for this week. If you want to find the show, you can head over to editorsnotecomics.com on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. If you want to get the show a week early, you can head to patreon.com slash editorsnotecomics. Buck a month will get you this show a week early every single week. And my other show, the Editor's Note Comics podcast, a day early, because I record those much closer to their release date. Yeah. Think about Patreon, guys. Please. We're poor. Kind of. Yeah. Also, rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. And other platforms that I don't check. Yes. Mostly iTunes. Do that one. Yes. We're going for the, like, A-game podcasting platform. Forget about the rest. Wow. Harsh. Look, I, I just want to try and focus our energies. In any case, where can our listeners come if they want to see a page from this arc? Oh, yeah. A store. 210 Water Street, downtown Hollowell, Maine. Come hey, come say hi to us. Spend, I probably won't be there. Spend some money. You'll be there. Podcast Dog will be there. Say hi to him. He's asleep. He is. He's a good boy. But we'll be back next week for more Buffy. Sounds good. See you then. <laughs>